Uh, thanks everyone for joining and thanks for the organizers to, uh, to give me an opportunity to present my research. As you can see, and this is not from my current research interest. Uh, this is the work that I did my during my uh, PhD uh, uh, with Professor Eric Galaj. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to talk about the value of randomized strategies in distributionally robust to discover network interdiction problems. Uh, you will see, soon see why the topic, uh, so the his title is so long. So the motivation for this work comes from a drug interdiction problem. Uh, uh, you might know, know that there is a big opioid crisis in, in US. There's a lot of uh, people who are dying because of consuming illegal drugs, particularly fentanyl. Uh, so there is recently a Shaheen Portman coronal bill to enhance fentanyl interdiction. So what is the maximum flow network interdiction problem? We have a grid network here. This is the source and this is the sink. The adversary wants to maximize the flow from the source to the sink. And there is an interdictor who commits to removing arcs at the start of the game. And then once the interdictor has committed, adversary routes flow in the network. A feasible solution or uh, basically, if suppose you have a budget of interdicting two arcs, you can choose to remove these two arcs from the network. Another feasible strategy is to remove these two arcs. An interdictor can randomize, that is, choose with probability u the left plan and one minus u the right plan. And the objective is how should the interdictor randomize among the feasible interdiction plans? Here we have two sources of uncertainty. One is a known source of uncertainty due to the randomization strategy. Another is an unknown source of uncertainty, which is due to the fact that the capacities of the arcs in the network are not known. Basically, from the data, you cannot conclusively tell what is the distribution of the capacities as you cannot know the congestion that will occur on a given day. So these two sources of uncertainty have been handled in the literature. Uh, uh, under uh, different assumptions on the model. The first simplest case is you consider that the capacity of the arcs in the networks are deterministic and the interdictor is using mm -hmm. a deterministic strategy. One can consider stochastic capacities, that is assume a distribution for the uh, capacities of the arcs, uh, assume a interdiction strategy to be deterministic, and consider different risk measures to model the behavior of the interdictor. For instance, expectation, conditional value at risk, or value at risk. Recently, uh, Barsimas and others considered that the capacities are known, but the interdictor is using a randomized strategy. This is a classical setup of uh, a Stackelberg game problem that you might know, where the leader commits to a randomized strategy and follower does not observe the realization from the randomized strategy. And then you are trying to find what is the best optimal randomized strategy. In our paper, we look at a different problem. We assume that the capacities of the arcs are not known, which is more realistic than considering that the distribution is known. The interdiction strategy is assumed to be randomized. Uh, and the risk, risk measure is conditional value at risk. We ask the question, can the interdictor benefit from randomization when the follower can observe the action of the interdictor? In this case, can interdictor benefit? Yes. So in this case, you mean that the leader is the interdictor and yeah. the follower is whoever routes traffic. Yes, network, right? yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this is the question that we want to answer in this paper. Uh, you can see that uh, network interdiction is a hot topic. Uh, which can be seen by the occurrences of the word keyword network interdiction on Google is Scholar from 2005 to 2022. From ML perspective, this might not be a hot topic, but I would say that in OR, still considered a hot topic. So uh, before we go to the model, we need to <coughs> understand two things. One is ambiguity aversion and another is risk aversion. Many real world applications involve uncertain parameters, say psi, Stochastic programming approach is assumed that a distribution of psi is known and 
we aim to find a policy that performs uh, the best, where the best is determined by the expectation or the average performance, assuming that the distribution is F psi. It may happen that the, there is imprecision in the estimation of the distribution, uh, resulting in what is known as post decision disappointment or out of uh, sample disappointment. Distributionally robust optimization uh, seeks to address this issue by constructing an ambiguity set such that the decision maker is protected from the worst case distributions that lie in this ambiguity set. So basically what you do is you try to construct an ambiguity set from the data and the size of the ambiguity, using the size of the ambiguity set, you control the conservatism, conservativeness of the model and thereby the out of sample disappointment that can occur in your problem. Now you can see that distributionally robust optimization acts as a bridge between data and stochastic programming approaches. If the ambiguity set is a single term, then distributionally robust optimization reduces to a stochastic programming problem. Next, let's look at um, risk aversion. In most of the literature, people consider uh, expectation as a risk measure, meaning that the policies are evaluated based on their average performance. But in many real world applications like law enforcement, safety critical systems, and algorithmic fairness, one is concerned about the tail of the distribution. One of the measures that is used is conditional value at risk, which is the average loss in the worst one minus alpha percent scenarios. If alpha is equal to zero, CVAR reduces to an expectation. So this was a crash course on ambiguity aversion and risk aversion. Now we can look at the model. So we have a directed network here. First, uh, if anybody has questions, please feel free to ask. I mean, we have, I hope, enough time. Okay, we have a directed network, G, with nodes V and arcs denoted by E. Delta minus I denotes the arcs leaving node I. Delta plus I denotes the arcs entering node I. The flow in the graph is denoted by X and the flow is bounded by the capacity of the arcs. Flow needs to be conserved at all the nodes, meaning that the flow that enters a node should be equal to the flow that leaves the node, except uh, the source node and the sink node because all the flow needs to emanate from the source and has to enter the sink. The set of feasible interdiction plans is denoted by calligraphic L here. Here LE is equal to zero means that the arc E is not interdicted. LE equal to one means that arc E is removed. You have a budget to remove B arcs. So this is the set of feasible interdiction plans. The distribution over the set of feasible interdiction plans is denoted by delta L. U here is the randomized strategy of the interdictor, which lies in the, in the delta cal L calligraphic set. <laughs> the set of distribution of arc capacities is denoted by calligraphic Q. We assume that the, uh, that the set Q con contains discrete distributions with K scenarios. Huh. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so in the physical set of interdiction plans, I mean, is it just all possible combination of interdictions or some like some two inter, for example, interdicts enter uh, having an interdiction on two arcs at the same time could be uh, yeah. feasible? So so you uh, so it's basically a vector. L is a vector. So you can interdict one, two, three, four, five. Okay, arcs. but you have no constraints about, I mean, there's there's not uh, like a combination of two interdiction at the same time that is not feasible. Like for example, you cannot um, interdict uh, arc I and arc G at the same time for, I don't know, some reason. For example, two no, uh, yeah, we don't assume that uh, any any constraint, you can interdict all the okay, All of them yeah. and any type of combination. Okay. Yeah, but we, you can include it in the, basically in the feasible set. It's possible to, to do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's just the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, for each interdicted arc L, uh, interdiction plan L and scenario K, the follower solves a maximum flow problem. This constraint ensures that the flow is conserved 
and uh, this this ensures a bound on the cap on the flow which is bounded by the capacity of the arc after interdiction what we want to solve is a distributionally robust uh, maximum flow network interdiction problem that we introduce in this paper an inter interdictor is choosing the randomizer strategy to minimize the worst case conditional value at risk nature is choosing a distribution from the set calligraphic q to maximize the conditional value at risk of the interdictor conditional value at risk <laughs> uh is defined here uh, so basically you are choosing interdictor is choosing of zeta to uh, to minimize this function you can see here that the conditional value at risk is defined over the joint distribution of the capacities of the arcs and the set of interdicted arcs this is the problem uh, if the set is q is convex you can basically interchange uh, min okay i can go back sure so you can interchange max and min so uh, the, your uh, huh f is the distribution of the uh, chosen path oh this is the flow f is the flow yeah. f is the maximum flow that can be routed once the interdicted arcs and the k have realized is the scenario yeah. okay there there are three issues in this problem one is that this is an infinite dimensional problem because uh, q uh, this constant is indexed by q which lies in the calligraphic q set another issue is that this problem is non convex because of this bilinearity between u and zeta which are both decision variables of the interdictor the third thing is that the size of the problem grows, grows exponentially uh, with the size of the network because if you consider a graph with 400 edges a budget to remove six arcs then inter number of interdiction plans is equal to 10 to the power 12 and you are randomizing over these 10 to the power 12 plans to find the optimal solution so this is the scale of the problem problem that we might be interested in uh first we will address the issue of uh, uh infinite dimensionality of the problem you can consider uh so what we do is we consider ambiguity set of this form it consists of all distributions such that uh, they are z away from the reference distribution. So consider q hat to be an empirical distribution. Z is the parameter that controls the size uh, of the problem. And what you want to do is uh, uh, what nature wants to do is choose this q in this <laughs> calligraphic q set. So this is the ambiguity set. From Fenchel duality, we can obtain a robust counterpart of this problem. This depends on the support function of the set Z here. And we can choose different uh, set Z to, to control the size of the uh, ambiguity set. Uh, here we have considered a polyhedral set that approximates the L2 norm ball. Uh, now, the support function of the set can be obtained by solving this uh, optimization problem. So what we can do is basically combine this uh, with this constraint. Now we have a finite dimensional problem, but there is one more issue left, which is that this problem is bilinear. That is, it's not, not convex. And we want to find a global optimal solution to this problem. What we can do is we can use a spatial branch and bound algorithm. Suppose you have a non-convex problem like this. Uh, you want to find a global optimal solution. What you can do is you branch on this feasible space. Note here that the feasible space is continuous here. It's not uh, discrete. So first you divide this region into two intervals. Now you find a lower bound and an upper bound of the function in both these regions. You can see here that the upper bound is greater than the, uh, you can see here that the lower bound in region two is greater than the feasible solution. So optimal solution cannot be in this region. So you prune this region. You are left with this region. Now you keep doing this step until you have converged to the optimal solution, much like what you do in branch and bound. So you can get an upper bound by fixing zeta. You can see that this problem is uh, linear. And uh, you can solve a linear program to get u, 
Now you can keep iterating until you have converged to a local optimal solution. This will give you a upper bound for the problem. Now let's look at how to get a lower bound for this problem. You have a bilinear constraint here. Uh, it is known that McCormick inequalities, which are here, provide a uh, underestimated for this constraint. If you can uh, now to get better convex relaxations, we add this valid inequality to obtain a tighter relaxation for our problem. Okay, so now this is the convex relaxation where I have made some uh, substitutions to get it in a compact form. YL is basically delta L, UL, eta L. Okay, it's a vector. The issue here is that this problem is still a large scale problem and we have to solve this within a spatial branch and bound algorithm. So we have to solve this problem, large scale problem repeatedly over time, uh, over each iteration. So we need a better solution to, to we want to accelerate basically the solution of this problem. What you can do is, uh, we know that the, uh, the idea here is that the optimal randomized strategy might have a small support. It may not have the support of 10 to the power 12. The optimal support could be only five. So what we can do is we find the optimal support and then we are done. So first what we do is for all L which lie in calligraphic L and are outside L hat, we say that YL is zero. Only for L which are interdition plans which are in L hat, which is a small set, uh, YL is not equal to zero. Next, we compute the dual of this problem. Now we show that if you can solve this problem, this, uh, this problem can be represented as a mixed integer linear program. And if you find an L that is in calligraphic L set, you can add it to L hat and solve this restricted master problem. You can keep doing this until you have converged. That is if no violating L is found in L, then you can conclude that L hat is the optimal support. This is what a classical column generation procedure we do, but there are some more technicalities that we encountered in this paper. Uh, I can discuss it later on. So uh, this is how you resolve this spatial branch and bound algorithm uh, embedded with a column generation procedure. And now I will just go through the some of the numerical experiments that we did, but if you have any questions, I would be happy to take it now. Is there any reason why the spatial branch and bound directly without, for instance, doing RLT or stuff like that? Oh, I mean, I, I didn't understand. So RLT, uh, uh, because it's non-convex, so we cannot actually, we cannot solve this problem, right? So with RLT only. Yeah, sure, but there's no convex constraints, still you can do RLT. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, then you will get a convex relaxation, yes. Yeah. So is there like did you try doing that or you just thought that the special branch amount was more efficient in the end? So so what we did was uh, maybe uh, within each node of the special branch and bound algorithm. Uh, so a special branch and bound is implemented using the uh, using RRLT. I would say you need for a special branch uh, in order to solve this problem you can get an underestimator using RRLT. Okay. Uh, but then you need an overestimator. You cannot conclusively say that you have reached an optimal solution. So the spatial branch and bound algorithm is able to tell us that with some guarantee that we have converged. Yes. I have a question actually on that uh, same slide. Yes, yes. Um, I was wondering um, how do you how do you choose the midpoints? You see, when in the special branch and bound, how how can you choose the midpoints such that the two problems that you're solving are complex? How do okay. you know where these? Oh, oh, so 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 it's uh, it's uh, 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 it's a linear program here. So under under okay, I can show you here. So this is the this is the nonlinear. This is the non-convexity. That uh, this is the uh, equation that is causing non-convexity. What you can do is replace this with this. This is the linear program. So we always get a linear program as a as a underestimator. Okay, so you know okay. But what I mean is that you in the in the figure that yeah, you yeah. show there, the essentially the non-convexity is broken essentially at this midpoint that you have there. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, how can you know that okay, okay. So I could have taken any point and I will always get an underestimate. It's which is convex. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's the underestimator that needs to be convex. I can always ensure using this binding uh, this uh, McCormick inequalities 
because I have replaced basically this with this. The whole problem is replaced, and I'm solving an underestimator. It's always convex by definition. Yeah. Is there any other question? How am I doing on time? No, you're good. Okay. Yeah, I have. You still have. Um, okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, this is the column generation procedure that we used. Uh, now I will uh, show some numerical experiments that we did. Uh, first, we generated the capacity scenarios using a factor model, uh, where C is the capacities, F are the factors, and psi i is independently distributed according to an exponential distribution with mean mu i. Here, F and mu are randomly generated for a given instance. Uh, we conducted experiments on a grid network. Actually, this network is quite standard in network introduction literature. Uh, there are a series of papers which have used this network. Uh, how we generate this network is as follows between the columns that is so between this column and this column the arcs always point toward the direction of the thing while within a column the arcs can point upward or downward with equal probability and uh, the size of the problem is given by m cross n cross k where m is the number of rows n is the number of columns uh, in the paper, we showed that a spatial branch and bound converges for all instances of size 10 cross 10 cross 10, 15 cross 15, and 20 cross 20. So this is fairly large scale problem. And now I will tell you why I would consider it as a large, realistic, I would call it a reasonable size problem, not a very large problem. Uh, but I will show you why uh, I can call this a fairly large. First, let's look at the comparison of our model with a heuristic approach. A person can say, if you fix zeta, this problem that you are showing is linear. So why can't you just discretize the space of zeta? Zeta lies in zeta lb to zeta ub. You will solve uh, the number. Uh, suppose you, you have 32 uh, points on this interval. You will solve 32 linear programs. It's very quick. And you will get an optimal solution. Uh, not an optimal solution, uh, a good enough solution. Now you can see here that. Uh, um, for the heuristic approach, uh, it, even after uh, around 200 seconds, it's not able to uh, it's not able to get an opti uh, um, a optimality gap of 10 lower than 10 to the power minus 12. Here, the optimality gap is on the y-axis. On the x-axis, it's the computational time. While our spatial branch and bound algorithm gives an optimality gap of 10 to the power minus 3 in around 60 seconds. Similarly, I can change the here gamma is the size of the ambiguity set. So by even for different ambiguity sets, uh, you can see that uh, different sizes of the ambiguity sets, you can see that our spatial branch and bound algorithm uh, gives a much better solution in sufficiently less time. Next, what we do is we compare the Gurovi's bilinear solver, our spatial branch and bound algorithm, and the spatial branch and bound algorithm with the column generation procedure. When the size of the problem is small, the number of interdiction plans is 76, uh, you can see that our algorithm is not doing good because it has to solve, uh, the column generation procedure has to solve a mixed integer problem, which is quite large. Here, the number of scenarios are 100 and 200. Uh, so that you are basically solving a mixed integer problem by what you should have done is not use column generation. You directly use the spatial branch and bound algorithm that we develop and you can get a good solution. Now, uh, uh, what, what we did was we increased the size of the network to 496 because it's a grid network. You can see now that uh, a spatial branch and bound algorithm with column generation solves the problem in uh, uh, quite quite quickly as compared to both SBB and the uh, Gurovi solver. Uh, now, if we increase the size to 861, now here 861 is a very small size uh, problem. You can see that Gurovi's bilinear solver is not able to solve any of the instances uh, that we gave it, only for 861 size network. So this is actually five cross five cross five. I was talking about 20 cross 20 cross 20, which is quite large. So. Uh, this is, these are uh, basically the real world network, Nobel U US and Seox calls. And grid network is the synthetic network that we considered in the paper. Now what, let's look at what is the value of randomization uh, in, in, in this network interdiction problem. 
value of randomization is basically the percentage improvement in worst case CVAR that can be obtained by using randomized strategy uh, rather than using a deterministic strategy. Now we consider 100 instances. For the instances where we saw that there is a value of randomization greater than 1%, we computed the average value of randomization. You can see that it can be as high as 11.66%. But there is a catch here that for most of the instances, you can see here, uh, the value of randomization is less than equal to 1%. So we don't see that there are many instances where you, 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 you have value in randomizing. Uh, again, this is an open question. How can you, uh, what are the combinatorial optimization problems where we can get more value in randomizing as compared to uh, networking prediction problem? Uh, so, to conclude, uh, we considered a distributionally robust risk covers network interdiction problem. We designed a spatial branch and bound algorithm which can efficiently solve problems of reasonable sizes, I would say. Uh, and randomization can be quite effective in reducing the risk exposure obtained from the optimal deterministic interdiction strategy. There are other problems that one can consider. For instance, a shortest path network interdiction problem where the, the set ambiguity set consists of continuous distributions. Uh, one of the popular distribution uh, ambiguity set is the Wasserstein ambiguity set that is quite popular even in uh, machine learning literature. One can consider a Nash game where um, both agents are using a CVAR as a risk measure and are ambiguity averse as well. And another last problem that one can consider could be a security game with multiple followers and a single leader. And that's it for, for my side. Thank you very much for your attention.